Hello everyone, lovely to be here. Um, I wasn't aware I wasn't being paid. I didn't know what to tell That's not true, that's not true. That's not true. Um, so, if I can have my uh, slides. Thank you. Nobody fucks with Batman. No, nobody does, right? Um, because he's so smart, because he's so strong, because he has all those wonderful toys, you wouldn't pick a fight with Batman. He's undefeatable. And he's undefeatable for all those reasons, but also for another reason. He's got Robin, yeah? His trusty right-hand man helping him out. And whichever Batman movie or TV series you follow, there's inevitably many moments where Robin saves Batman and saves the day. But we don't really talk much about Robin. It's Batman and Robin, or just Batman. We forget the integral role that Robin plays in Batman's overall success. The same is true of Peter Pan. He is the boy that never grew up. He's always successful in evading Captain Hook, and he always comes out on top. But again, if you follow the Peter Pan movie, you discover, as I do with seven-year-old daughter, um, you discover and over and over again that it's often Tinkerbell that is the real reason for his ultimate victory. Tinkerbell is smarter and wiser and sometimes slightly frustrated at the performance of Peter Pan and she makes subtle interventions to allow him to emerge successful. The same is true for James Tiberius Kirk, Captain Kirk, yeah? He's literally never lost a battle. He protects the Enterprise, he saves the crew, he sometimes saves whole planets, partly because he's a brilliant strategist and incredibly brave and talented, but also because he has his trusty first lieutenant, Spock, looking after him, yeah? And Spock slightly disapproves of Kirk's more eccentric ways, but again, ultimately makes vital interventions just to make sure everything works out perfectly in the end. And we could talk about Wonder Woman, yeah? An eternal Athenian superhero. She is incredible. And again, always emerges victorious, partly because she is a superhuman, but also because she has her trusty right-hand man slash lover, who, again, if you follow the first movie and the slightly disappointing second one, literally saves the day. And yet, no one knows the guy's name. Yeah? Even though he literally saves her life three times in the first movie. Go on, what's he called? You don't fucking know, do you? See? <laughs> that makes me angry. Doesn't really, but you know. We, we forget about the trusty supporter, yeah? Han Solo, the great space pirate. You didn't think this morning when you were rushing down George Street, you were gonna learn about space pirates this morning, did you? Big surprise. Han Solo, the space pirate, who did the Kessel run in less than 13 parsecs. How is that possible? It's possible because he wasn't even driving his own ship. Chewbacca is the pilot of the Millennium Falcon. If you watch the movie, Chewie is the one killing all the stormtroopers. Han Solo just looks good and has good one-liners and gets all the attention. But Chewie does all the work, right? But because he's seven foot tall and a Wookiee and has a massive speech impediment, no one, no one gives him the credit that he deserves. It's true. Superman, yeah, okay, he's the superhero, but without Lois Lane, he's a loser. He's a loser, yeah? Even Frodo Baggins, yeah? Who's different from these others because he's a fictional character, of course, but Frodo Baggins... <laughs> in the three books or the three films, is on his own consistently unsuccessful. He's getting stabbed by black riders, bitten by giant spiders, and ultimately, at the end of the third movie, fails in his ultimate quest. Yeah, he isn't the Lord of the Rings. In fact, he doesn't want to do it, he backs down. It's his trusty best friend, Sam, that saves him each time, and in the end, destroys the ring. But no one remembers that, yeah? They just 
see Frodo. And we can use the same logic finally on Sherlock Holmes. It's just the adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Or it's Sherlock Holmes and Moriarty, his arch enemy. No one talks about Dr. Watson. Even though Watson is often, again, the guy that saves the day, the guy that makes the important intervention that protects Sherlock and his quite fragile mental state, it's Dr. Holmes that is just as important to the success of these cases. But we don't think enough about him. Well, in this session, I want to think more about him, yeah? I want to think more about these second characters that don't get enough attention. They're practical. They're stoic. They're very loyal. They're dependable. They're surprisingly hot. <laughs> I changed that one last night. I thought, hey, it's surprisingly hot. They're dedicated, they're unpretentious, and ultimately, more than anything else, they're supportive. And yet we don't give them enough credit, we often forget about them because we're dazzled by the overall success of the main protagonist. I'm talking, of course, about sidekicks. And I'm gonna make an argument that radio is the ultimate media sidekick. What do we mean by a sidekick? According to the dictionary, a person closely associated with another as a subordinate or partner. But I mean that two things here, right? Sidekicks do a really important thing and save the day and make everything great. And they usually don't get the recognition they deserve for achieving that success. That's what I mean by these sidekicks here. And I want to look at radio, which in my experience is the ultimate sidekick with a little bit of data to demonstrate my point. I'm going to talk about excess share of voice, ESOV. Most of you work in media, you know this better than I do, but for the benefit of everyone in the room, just give me three minutes just to explain ESOV, the most important concept in advertising and media. Of that, there is no doubt, okay? So, ESOV, it was really, discovered in 1990 by John Philip Jones, the late great advertising thinker, who published an article in Harvard Business Review showing there was an equivalency to how much money you spend relative to competitors and how much market share you get, yeah? And it's a very important HBR, still widely cited to this day. It was then picked up by Field and Burnett. Everyone should know Field and Burnett from the long and the short of it. What you may not know is Field and Burnett are also responsible for the concept of ESOV. They took the work of Jones and others and created this idea of excess share of voice. So the long and the short isn't their only work, yeah? And, and it's a very important bit of work that they've done to conceptualize ESOV about 12 years ago. Excess share of voice. The reason I think excess share of voice is so important is I, I don't believe in marketing science. I don't believe in law-like principles for marketing. I think it's hoo-ha. But even I am convinced that excess share of voice is like gravity. If you don't have it, things aren't going to happen as much as they could. And the proof is even the Dark Lord of Penetration himself, Byron Sharp, published a paper 10 years ago in which he confirmed, yeah, basically excess share of voice is a thing. I'm pretty sure he started out trying to disprove it because Ehrenberg Bass hate any theory not invented by Ehrenberg Bass, as we know. But in this case, begrudgingly at the end of the paper, he basically says, yeah, okay, fuck it. It's, it's true, right? <laughs> Anything not invented by Ehrenberg Bass that's been confirmed by Ehrenberg Bass, you definitely know it's a thing. And then it's been picked up by the B2B Institute. Um, it's one of their five principles of growth. And here in Australia, thanks to Rob Britton and Peter Field last year, it was re-examined for the digital age, and the authors concluded ESOV remains a critical marketing planning metric. Positive ESOV improves the effectiveness of both lower and higher attention campaigns. It's still super important. Now, I shouldn't have to say that, but I do have to say it. 
I love MI3. MI3 is great. Love your podcast. But this is the most disgraceful piece of shit I, I listened to last year. Yeah? <laughs> Sorry, I have to be honest. The great Rob Britton had to put up with whoever this guy is while he said ESOV isn't a thing and it's never been a thing. It's, but didn't cite any data or any evidence. And this is what marketers do. Even the things that we've established as being right, some idiot has to turn up and go, oh, I don't think that's true. Yeah? We're a really, really annoying discipline. Just when we establish something, someone has to mistakenly attempt to bring it back down again with no evidence at all. ESOV is a thing, the end, okay? So what do we mean by ESOV? So the thing that John Philip Jones identified, that we've identified a thousand times since, is if you look at any market and any category, and you look at the share of voice of all the brands in that category, and then you look at their, that brand's share of market, there is a remarkable correlation between the two. And what we mean by excess share of voice is if I take that share of voice number on the y-axis and I subtract that market share number on the x-axis, I get a number. And if that number's positive, if it's excess, it's a very good signal that growth will follow. Yeah? Because there's an equilibrium between these two numbers. It's often shown as a 45 degree angle, but that's incorrect. Because there's a little wrinkle at the bottom and the top. At the bottom, it's a difficult thing for smaller brands. Because the equilibrium roughly in the middle is 5%, 5%, yeah? If you've got 5% market share, you need about 5% share of voice to maintain that share. But if you have 1% market share in most categories, it's no good having a 1% share of voice. That won't protect and you will decline. Small brands have to work harder and spend more just to defend their share because marketing isn't fucking fair. Nobody said it was, yeah? And at the top, big brands get it easy. A big brand can have a 25, 30% share of market, doesn't need 25, 30% share of voice. It could be 20% or 18% and it will probably still, all things being equal, maintain its share. Because again, marketing isn't fair. Being a big brand is the biggest single driver of advertising effectiveness. Better than creativity, better than even ESOV. We forget that point. Big brands have it easy because it's not fair, okay? But for the most part, with those two exceptions, brands usually sit remarkably consistently on that equilibrium. If they have 10% share of voice, they have about a 10% share of market. And it's stunningly recurrent. When we talk about excess share of voice, we talk about brands that break the equilibrium, that spend more than they need to to maintain their share and drive excess. In this example, the brand has decided to double its spend on advertising, and let's assume the rest of the competitors do not respond. As a result, we now have an excess share of voice of plus 10, because, trust me on this, 20 minus 10 is 10, yeah? <laughs> I'll, I'll take you all through it later if you work for a creative agency, okay? <laughs> I'm only joking, I'm only joking, I'm only joking. 20 minus 10 equals plus 10, okay? Why is that important? It's because the equilibrium always eventually wins. If you maintain that excess, competitors don't respond, you keep investing, over time, what's gonna happen is, your market share is gonna grow, yeah? And this isn't me telling you this. This is based on thousands, literally thousands of empirical examples. You will get, approximately, your share of voice and share of market. And the thing also works in reverse. You can have a negative excess share of voice. In this case, you're actually underspending. Now, you've got minus 10. The equilibrium will still get you. Over time, you're saving money, but you're also gradually going to lose share as you revert back to the equilibrium, okay? Okay, that's excess share of voice. The question clients always want to know is, okay, if I give you 10 percentage points of excess share of voice, how long before I get my 10 points of market share, right? Because that's kind of important. Well, the answer is, in this instance, about seven or eight years, because on average, you pick up about 0.6 percentage points of market share for every year of 10%, yeah? Again, based on thousands of case studies. We call that the efficiency. 
the ESOV efficiency. How efficient will my excess be? The answer is about 0.6%. Now, the reason it's ish is that's a very big average from, again, thousands of data points. If you break it down by category, what you begin to learn is there are different efficiencies based on which category you're in. B2B, slightly more elastic. Yeah? Financial services, massively sensitive to increases in excess share of voice. You get the idea, OK? But just for the sake of the next bit, let's just take the overall average B to C, OK? Picking up with 10% excess share of voice, about 0.6 points of market share per year. Cumulative, OK? You can fuck around with the efficiency in a positive way. That's just the average. So if you want to get more than 0.6% in a year, you can, according to the data, do other stuff. For example, if you were to run an emotional campaign, your average would go up to 0.8. Because emotional campaigns, going back to what Ferrier said this morning, are far more powerful and effective than rational campaigns or emotional and rational campaigns. Yeah? Emotion works better. We live in an era we've never had less emotion yeah? in our advertising, and yet we've never known more clearly that it's super fucking effective. Yeah? And when I say emotion, I'm not just talking about the koalas in the tree and the orphan's going to fucking try and save him and he's got one leg and, oh, you know. There's a place for that, but emotion can be fear or humor. Yeah? There's a very broad wheel of, of, of emotion that's missing from a lot of your ads. Let's fuck around with it even more. One of the arguments in favor of Ehrenberg Bass is, if you have an excess share of voice and you have the budget to commit to sophisticated mass marketing, you end up getting a massive 2.6% uh, annual increment in market share, yeah? proving the power and effectiveness of what the Ehrenberg Bass Institute preach. Even better, and most famously from Peter Field's early work, if you have excess share of voice and creatively awarded work, good creative, you get a massive 2.8% annual growth in market share. Yeah? So what we're saying is ESOV can be bent. It can be improved. The question I wanted to answer for today's session is, what about radio? If we have an excess share of voice, and if we have radio in our mix, does it help or hinder the effectiveness of the campaign? That's, that's where this starts from. And in fact, where it starts from is, cute old picture of me from 15 years ago. Um, it, it, originally, the CRA rang me up and said, would you come and do this gig? And I said, eh, I've got this one thing about radio I really like. If you fund this research, I'll come and talk about it. Because I have this prevailing, I've actually got two theories, as you'll see. And the theories come from a report that was published about seven or eight years ago. The British equivalent of the CRA, Radio Centre, published this report in the UK. And in this report, they listed, it was a really interesting bit of research, they listed what advertising agencies and clients thought about different media, and then they contrasted it with the data. And it was a really beautiful bit of work, but also it was great because the Radio Centre guy spent about half a million bucks on a report that actually said radio wasn't the best. TV was better than radio, and I fucking loved that. And I said to the radio center guys, I love the fact you've gone to town with a report where you're only second, yeah? Not first. I love that you've done that. Because you've all been to events where we do an econometric analysis, and what do you know? Whoever's sponsoring this, TikTok or fucking TV or news media, has got a better ROI than everything else, yeah? And it's horseshit. Someone's got to be lying to you. Most of them are lying to you, right? Well, no, it's econometrics. We got a 14 to 1 versus 13 to 1. Give us all your money, right? And here was radio going, yeah, we're second. It's pretty good. And I said to a radio guy afterwards there, I said, I fucking love the fact you did this. And he said, that's radio. He said, we're not arrogant. We, we play well with others. I remember saying, we play well with others. We don't have to be number one, yeah? And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. And the other thing which was interesting is in this same report, there's this nice bit of data about if you have some money spent on the following tools, rank it in terms of what it does to overall campaign ROI. And again, radio, which is quite a little investment, was really doing a lot of good for the overall campaign, even though clients, you know, sort of got it and sort of didn't. So 
That's how it started. So I said to CRA, I'd like to explore this one theory that with clients of mine, when we do a little bit of radio, the whole fucking thing works better. And then we got Rob, uh, who's a proper statistician, and we briefed Rob and said, this is what we'd like to try and show. Can you go into the database at the ACA and see if it's true or not? And if it isn't true, we won't fucking mention it, but if it is true, Ritson will come and talk about it to clients, okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm being dead straight with you, okay? So it's obviously true. So what's the database we're using? It's, it's the uh, Advertising Council's database. When you submit for an FE, um, the data is, all, is, is uh, all provided to the ACA, and they have access to it. A lot of it's redacted publicly, but they have all of it internally. And this is data ranging from 2018 to 2023. There's about 460 campaigns, big campaigns. If you've ever seen an FE submission, they're big things, right? 25 pages, they're independent. And we've got a strong heritage of using them for marketing theory. Field and Burnett's work is built from the British equivalent of this, albeit a bigger database. So here's the two hypotheses. Number one, when you add radio to an excess share of voice campaign, you get a catalytic effect across the whole campaign. A little bit of radio makes the whole thing work better. And second, because it's radio, the amount of money you need to divert to radio to get this boost is relatively small. Yeah, that's what I'm trying. I'm trying to measure, is radio really the sidekick that I've always thought it is, that I've always said to clients, you want a bit of radio, man, it's a great sidekick. It's like Batman and Robin, right? I want to empirically check that I'm not full of shit yeah? on this one point. On other points, I obviously am. So let's get to it. Let's not fuck around. If you have a campaign with excess share of voice with some radio, does it work better than without? Da, da, da. So the data we've got from the ACA is the, is the standard one, which is the average number of very large business effects. So depending what your objectives are, uh, acquisition, brand building, retention, whatever it might be, did you see a very large increase as a result of your campaign? Now, what we've done is we've indexed all of the campaigns in the database to 100. And then we've looked at all the campaigns that had a positive ESOV. So that's campaigns that are all in the top above the equilibrium. No surprise, there shouldn't be a surprise. There's 25 points more business effects on average if you have an excess share of voice. We're proving excess share of voice. Shouldn't surprise anyone except that one guy that said it doesn't exist, okay? If we look at campaigns that have an excess share of voice but don't use radio, that figure drops though to just 16 points above the index. It's still superior, because you've got excess share of voice, but it's less superior because inside all those positive campaigns are campaigns that do use radio. And they, thankfully, managed to be 32 points more prevalent with significant business effects. So thank fuck, it turns out I'm right, and also, more importantly, that radio really is a catalytic uh, uh, medium. quite a significant one, because what we're saying is, first of all, excess share of voice, that's Batman, okay? You have more investment than your competitors relative to your market share, you're going to get yourself 16 points above the index. But if that excess share of voice also includes Robin, i.e. radio, you're going to get yourself another 16 points. It's as powerful as having excess share of voice is having radio as your sidekick in the campaign. Now, you're probably thinking at this point, fuck me, that's, um, that's strong. And it's probably stronger than I was expecting too. Why is radio giving such a nice boost to these, uh, these campaigns? Well, again, we can go back to the data and have a look. We can compare the positive campaigns, lots of ESOV, but no radio, with the ones that include radio on a number of different variables. First, acquiring customers. If you have radio in your mix, clients are reporting a significant boost in acquisition. Radio is a great media for recruiting new customers. The reverse at the bottom of the funnel is also true, though. If you invest in radio as part of your excess share of voice, we see four times, or three times, three and a half times, the impact on customer retention. It's a nice reinforcement medium as well. 
It also delivers on brand awareness. Again, you, positive ESV gives you a nice boost on brand awareness, but have radio there, it's a great medium for just driving overall brand awareness. And if you're a, a student of Ehrenberg Bass, we can give it to you in their language of mental availability. Slightly less impressive, but still significant and superior. Radio is good at bringing the brand to mind. And if you're a brand manager freak like me, it only builds brand awareness. Radio is also a great medium for driving brand associations and brand image. Again, superior. So you're getting a sense here that radio, like all good sidekicks, kind of underplays itself a little bit. Yeah? It does a really good job, better than most of us would have thought. Now, here's the second hypothesis. But how much radio do you need to invest in to get all these juicy little effects? Because it could turn into we need 80, 90% all of your money in order for this to happen. But again, my prevailing theory is radio is a sidekick. It doesn't like to be the boss. It likes to be on the side. So we looked at, again, all the campaigns as an index. And you'll remember that if we have positive excess share of voice that includes radio, we're getting 32 points of improved significant large business effects. We asked Rob to look at the data and work out the sweet spot. Yeah, as you know, media is an S, a curvilinear S. Where is the sweet spot where we see the best catalytic impact from these campaigns? The answer is 11%. Yeah? If you get 11% of your budget based on the sample we've got, you get the maximal catalytic impact for your radio investment. And what stunned all of us was the average, again, from a relatively small sample, but the average then doubles. So compared to the average ACA campaign, if you've got excess share of voice and 11% of it is put into radio, only 11 you will see, on average, a doubled effectiveness score in terms of very large business effects. That's a stunner, right? It's probably too positive. It almost looks a bit wobbly because it's so fucking good. I would have liked it to be 165, but I can't help it if it's better than that, right? So in summary, how would you double the impact of your campaign, at least based on this data? Well, first of all, again, you need to achieve excess share of voice that fits your ambitions for the brand. Excess share of voice is a reality check. I get clients who say, I want a double preference, right? What's your excess share of voice? Oh, we, we, don't have, we have less than we had last year, right? It's not going to happen. So first of all, you need excess share of voice. Second, add radio to your mix, yeah? Many of you in this room have clients that don't use radio at all, right? Give it 11% of the total budget, just 11%, OK? and expect to double the number of very large business effects that that campaign as a result accrues. Now, the asterisk is just to say there are other ways to make this bigger. We've talked about them. But radio is a demonstrable power in improving effectiveness for a relatively small amount of investment. Let me give you an example. I think in the last five or six years, the most successful campaign to come out of this particular island is Uber Eats. Sorry, Ferrier, if you're still here, but it's true. Right? Special Group did an amazing job. It's, you can say that on a number of different levels, right? It's the campaign that we've exported around the world from Australia. It's set up Uber Eats from nothing to be the market leader. The submission that won the FE, it's got every single data point you've ever seen. It was first-rate work, yeah? And if I said to this room, Uber Eats, you'd say, yeah, it was a digital campaign. All right, TV, yeah, TV, loads of TV. Online video, loads of outdoor, bit of sponsorship. All of that would be true. These are all the heroes of the campaign. What you would not appreciate is it was also a radio campaign. I can't give you the exact number of what proportion of the Uber Eats budget went on radio, but it's very close to, if not the same as, the shit I'm talking about being the sweet spot. That's all I can say, all right? But my point is, A, it was part of the most successful campaign in the last five or six years. And B, no one fucking knows that. That's the story of radio. When it's there, it really works. But none of us appreciate that it's working. So let me play you one of the many Uber Eats ads that was used to back up the rest of the campaign and had, I believe, a catalytic effect. 
Before I play you the ad, a warning. So the thing about digital and online video and cinema is it's a bit like Han Solo. It's good looking. If I show you a, a two minute cinema ad now, everyone shits their pants and goes, oh, that was fucking fantastic, right? Oh my God, that was amazing, right? Because we're in a very special context and big screen stuff suits big screens. We're radio, so we're like the, you know, we're the Wookiee, you know what I'm saying? It ain't gonna be like, oh my God, that was the best 12 seconds of audio I've ever heard in my life, you know? It, it doesn't work that way. This is just a powerful, brilliant example of what brands should be doing, and I'm gonna play it to you now, and underwhelm you in an impressive way. <laughs> this is Sharon Streslecki. Hi. Due to an acute case of bash rash, Sharon's decided to dine at home this evening. Tonight, I'll be eating spaghetti bolognese. Get well soon, Shazza. Order with Uber Eats tonight. That's it, see? But if you keep doing that, not just to drive short-term product stuff, but as a genuine adjuvacant to your brand building efforts, a sidekick to your digital, to your TV, to your outdoor, that's the point. Nobody knows Uber Eats was a radio campaign because it wasn't a radio campaign. It was a sidekick part of a much bigger set of hero media with radio doing all of that quiet work in the background. So I believe radio is your sidekick medium. It has a lower CPM than most of the other media that you get sold. So it's not bargain basement, but it's good value for money. It's an achievable sidekick. It, does, it isn't high maintenance. It does not claim that its impact is greater than others. I know Ferrier said that this morning, but he discounted. He was probably drunk as usual, right? <laughs> My point to you is radio isn't greater than other mediums. Robin isn't better than Batman, yeah? That's not the point. Sam isn't better than Frodo. Sam makes Frodo better, yeah? Robin makes Batman better. That's what radio does best. It plays well with others. In fact, it doesn't just play well with others, it makes the others look good, which ironically is a problem for radio because then all the money gets siphoned off because people don't realize how good it was. It takes no credit for itself, yeah? Instead, the credit goes to everyone else. And it does not ask for your total budget. This isn't TikTok attacking TV. Give me your TV budget and I'll be more effective times 300. That's not how radio rolls. It's not even asking for most of your money, yeah? Or even a big slice of it. Radio asks for 11% this year, just. 11% to have the sidekick effect on all the other all-star media which will deliver your brand to you. L let me do it another way before I finish. Let's take the sidekick away and that beautiful 210 index points of business effects. Let's remove the radio sidekick from the mix and what happens is this. You've still got positive ESOV, You've still got a relatively good result, but it ain't as good because radio isn't there anymore. It's like Peter Pan without Tinkerbell. It's like Superman without Lois Lane. Fucked, a bit fucked, yeah? <laughs> it's like Han Solo without Chewbacca. Dead, dead, you'll be dead if you don't invest in radio. <laughs> it's like Wonder Woman without her sidekick tied up in a curiously sexual way. <laughs> it's like Sherlock Holmes without Dr. Watson, thrown off a building. It's like Batman with Robin, also tied up in a curiously S&M kind of way. There's a, there's a pattern emerging here. It's like Captain Kirk without Spock. He loses all his clothing and doesn't know what's going on. That's you, that's you if you don't invest in radio. My point to you seriously is that radio advertising makes everything else work better. And because it makes everything else work better, we forget that radio advertising makes everything else work better. Now there are limitations to this work. First of all, I, I, you know, I don't believe any media is better than any other. It depends, it depends, it depends, yeah? Depends on three strategic factors. Who is your target and does it fit? What is your position? Does it fit? And what are your objectives for the year ahead? These strategic precepts 
must pre-exist any media choice. There is no one superior medium. Remember the forgotten law of integration. A times B will always be greater than 2A or 2B. There, again, isn't a superior medium. Even here we should say that, right? Because if you take a little bit of money from something, it will always give you a return if you spread it across two, almost every time. My point is, I think radio does it better and for less than most other media. We have a very small sample size. This is less than 500 cases. We have to, you would never get this published scientifically. It's a small sample, but it's still a significant one. If I look at the UK data, they found something similar, and that's a much bigger 20-year sample. When they've looked at uh, market growth with excess share of voice of 10 percentage points, those brands that use AM, FM radio advertising us are nearly five times more effective. Yeah? Four times something more effective. So they're finding something similar from a much bigger set in a different country. We have a small sample size. We have a skewed sample size. People go on about this. It's true. The ACA submissions are big brands from companies that think they have done a really good campaign. My point to you is that's something to aspire to, and although it makes it underrepresentative, it doesn't make it non-representative. And declared business effects are a famously contentious issue. This is the client saying, we had three big major business effects from this campaign. Finally, there may be other lurking variables and other statistical fuckery that I am not accounting for here. This isn't econometrics. So I don't know if there's other variables linked to radio that are correlating to this. I'm not aware of them, but they may be there. Nonetheless, my key message about radio, and I want you to hum this all the way home, is that brands with positive ESOV that invest 11% of their ad budgets on radio could expect to double their campaign effectiveness as a result, okay? In a nutshell, I want you <laughs> and radio to look like this this year, okay? And by the way, his name, his name is Steve Trevor. <laughs> Thank you very much.